Okay. This talk is about adding future addressing modes to GCC, and I'm Michael Meissner, and this is Bill Schmidt. Um, and various things about um, one of the reasons we're talking about right now, this is not for a machine that is currently in production. We can't talk about when it will, when these instructions or if these instructions will, will be present, but due to the long lead times in GCC and distributions and so forth, we, we felt that we need to start adding the f support for future machines now so that by the time the machines are generally available, GCC will have the support. Right now we use minus CPU equals future. When things get further gelled, we will obviously change the name. And one of the reasons is, is traditionally PowerPC has four different types of offset of instructions. That's register plus offset. Um, originally it had 16-bit instructions. They're called deform instructions. And as they added new instructions, they then added DS form. That's deform with the two bottom bits used for instruction encoding rather than offset. So you have to have things aligned on a th uh, on a 32 byte word 32 bit boundary. And then to further complicate things, they added DQ instructions. That's where the bottom four bits must be zero. And in addition, the the D form instructions. Um, allow for pre-increment, pre-modify, and pre-decrement, the auto stuff. But, but the newer instructions generally do not have those forms. And finally, to add complication, if the base register is zero, constant is used instead of GPR register zero. This is all just the standard history of the PowerPC. And, and as I said, in general, the original instructions load to 32-bit GPRs, load to uh, for single precision, double precision, to floating point registers were all deform. But uh, because they ran out of instruction space, when they added the 64-bit PowerPC, the new GPR instructions, the load word sign extended, the load double, and the store double are, are, are now DS form. And similarly, when we later added the instructions for, for Power 9, for loading to the Ultrabec registers, they also were D DS form, and the vector registers are, are DQ form. One of the problems with DQ form is, is because there's four bits that are taken off the address, you cannot really use it for talk uh, operations. So we typically, for anything that's vector oriented in Power 9, Power 9 was the first one that offered uh, offset instructions for vectors, you have to load up the address first and then use um, either the instruction with the offset or because you can't know that the talk instruction is, is properly aligned or load, it into, load the offset into a, a register. And so in this potential future machine, we, we now have a new in, prefix instruction. The prefix instruction goes before the, the normal instruction and this gives us many more bits for offsets. In particular, if a prefix instruction is before a deform instruction, a particular deform instruction, it will give you 34 bits of addressing instead of 16 bits. Early on, the original thoughts of the hardware designers were they would do the similar extension for DS and DQ. And as I started implementing this into the compiler, we came to the conclusion that we really, really would like to get rid of DS and DQ for at least the prefix instructions. And eventually they uh, decided to re-implement the instructions. And so prefix instructions do not have a deform, DS, or DQ form. They all, you get all 34 bits. But one, uh, you know, hardware gives things, but it also sometimes takes things away. And in the new prefixed instruction, it cannot cross the 64-byte boundary uh, due to caching and all this other kind of stuff. So even though the instruction itself is only 8 bytes, we have to be prepared for a no-op being inserted so that it won't cross the 64-byte boundary. And the assembler does this automatically, and, and the assembler also changes the, the alignment of the object file 
so that even if you didn't say you need 64 64 byte alignment it will automatically make the text section 64 bit alignment if you do any prefix instructions in addition to standard offset register plus offset we we did take a trick from other architectures of having a PC relative uh, bit in the, in the prefix instruction so that you can do uh, PC relative plus 34-bit offset. And that gives you a nice convenient range for, for doing it. And you, then you don't need to use top forms on the medium code mo model. And this is one of the major primary reasons for adding prefix instructions. Now, in the actual instruction, you could, in theory, have a PC rel the PC relative bit and then the register and then the offset. So you could, in theory, do PC plus register plus constant offset. Unfortunately, that would mean too many hardware gates, and the hardware team eventually said, no, if you want PC relative, the register must be zero. So you only have either PC relative with a fixed offset or you have load and store with a register plus offset. And you know, because we changed the stuff for DS and DQ, we, what we did was the actual second instruction follows the prefix has a different encoding now for those DS and DQ instructions rather than the traditional instruction, whereas in the D instructions, it's the traditional instruction. And again, the assembler is, and the linker are the only ones that really care about this encoding. So, wanted to show um, how we use this. Unlike some other assemblers for other architectures, we chose not to have the assembler be too smart and implement a prefix instruction just by, if you said an LD with a large offset or, or an offset that wouldn't fit in a DS format, it would automatically make it into a prefix thing. We force the user of the assembler to put a, an explicit P in front of the instruction. So you have LD uh, for the traditional instruction and PLD for the prefix instruction. And there are various combinations, you know, the prefix instruction has this PC relative bit in addition, so you could specify PLD, load the register, offset 4, register, or offset 100, register 4, and that it's PC relative. Generally, you don't do that. Generally, you say symbol at PC rel, like in the last line here. And in addition to the memory instructions, the load and store, one other instruction got extended, and that is the PAD, it is the ADDI, that's the add immediate instruction. So you can now say, PADDI and it'll add a 34-bit constant, or you can say to a register, or if you use register zero, it'll just load, do a load immediate. Or um, the PADDI instruction has the PC relative bit, so you can load up a PC relative address by, by doing PADDI register with the, uh, the offset, the PC relative bit set. And like with the load and store, you cannot use a register in that case. But we have assembler, we have PLI for loading up an immediate value, and PLA just to make things simpler. But the other immediate instructions, ORI, ANDI, and so forth, that have ORI and ORI shifted to do the 32-bit operation, we did not extend those. So those, if you're doing a 32-bit or immediate, you, you still have to do an ORI and an ORIS. And there's no P or I. In variant. And we added a bunch of new relocations to the linker and the assembler. Um, as you can see, we use the at PC rel to um, say that this is a PC relative reference. And if it, like, somewhere in the talk system, where if you have an external address, you can't do a memory operation on that external address because you don't know whether it's defined in the main program or defined in a shared library. So instead, you, you use um, PC rel at got that will create the reference to the variable in a got section and, and then load that up. However, the linker is smart. 
And if the symbol ultimately is in the main program and the program is being linked for the main program, if you do the operation with the uh, PLD with the foo at God, uh, p foo at PCRL at God, which can be a mouthful to say, it'll turn that into just a PLA, a PADI instruction to load the address, and it will not involve an actual memory operation. But if the address is in a shared library, such as Arano or other variables like that, it has to do like it does in the talk system, put the address somewhere else, and then do a load of that address from that location, and then put a, relocate, a word relocation on that so the dynamic linker can, can put the right address in, in there. And now it's Bill's turn to do the ABI. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm here to speak to all the ABI geeks in the room, and you know who you are. So, uh, the one thing I want to point out mostly about this is that we're making changes to the ELF v2 ABI for power, but we are not making an ABI break here. These are purely ABI extensions to support this. So what are we looking for? What's the reason for changing the ABI and using PC relative addressing in particular? Well, particularly we on power have a problem with function call performance using table of contents addressing that we have today. With uh, PC relative addressing, we can reduce the cost, in particular the path length of the function call by avoiding the save and restore of the register that uh, points to the table of contents uh, pointer. Um, also, if we have those things close together on small functions, sometimes we can have uh, stalls, particularly on some of our older hardware. Uh, we've, we've had problems with, uh, you know, stalls based on the memory uh, store being followed quickly by the memory load. When you have an out of order processor, that can cause you some difficulty sometimes. And so uh, this helps us avoid that as well. Uh, the addressing sequences that Mike's been talking to you about, and he'll give you more details on, are going to be uh, at least equal in performance to what we have today, and in some cases will be better. Uh, another advantage is that we get a little bit of uh, register pressure reduction. There is a dedicated register today that's used uh, to point to the table of contents, and uh, that talk register is now, count, now can be freed up, so we have one additional uh, non-volatile register to use. Right, and in addition, one of the things is, is that it eliminates two instructions at the beginning of the function to save the R2 and also the no-op after the call. So it, oftentimes we are seeing that somewhat shorter code. There are, of course, examples where it's the opposite, but usually it is slightly shorter code, too. So uh, the problem that we have, though, is that we can't just immediately switch over from talk-based addressing to PC relative addressing, because this is Linux, and Linux distributions live a long time. We have a lot of uh, packages out there that were built with talk addressing, and so even if we have uh, PC relative code with this new future processor, it still has to coexist with the existing talk-based code. So a large part of what I'm going to talk to you about is how we make sure that uh, we uh, support that stuff and what the changes in the ABI are that are necessary to make that happen. And that needs to be as efficient as possible. So here's some pictures that I hope are not too small and hard to read. Uh, this talks a little bit about, first of all, I'm going to talk about how we address private data. And the top picture shows you how it's done with talk relative addressing today. The bottom picture shows what the PC relative addressing will look like. So here, if you have a private variable, the way we address it today was with this two instruction sequence up in the upper right-hand corner, the add immediate shifted instruction and the load double instruction. What those do, they have this uh, two relocations, sim at talk at HA and sim at talk at L. Uh, we're creating a 32-bit offset and, and loading uh, from, the, from a pointer with that 32-bit offset. It requires two instructions to do that. And so what this will do, the sim at talk part of it says, I need to go and find this symbol dot toc dot which is established in our ABI as pointing somewhere into the, in the middle of the, uh, the dot talk section. Now you'll see I've got a, a, a layout of these various different sections, uh, which is uh, you know, sort of a sample layout that doesn't have to be in this order, but this is sort of a typical order of how sections are. So you've got the text section at the left, and then uh, data with the read-only uh, read data, and then the global offset table on the talk, 
and various other bits there, right? So the way we usually uh, address today is you have a, a base pointer, this dot talk dot symbol, uh, which is uh, somewhere in the middle, and that can point both left and right to all these other areas. Uh, so R2 is, uh, GPR2 is generally uh, reserved to point to that uh, register. And so this addressing will just go and find where R2 is, add the offset that we've got from the SIMET talk at HA and SIMET talk at L, and uh, go and find that variable off in the dot data section. So that's pretty simple. Uh, with PC relative to find that same thing, you're going to start with the current uh, instruction address. And so what I'm showing here at the upper right hand corner of the second uh, piece is we now have a single instruction with a 34-bit offset, PLD R10 SIM at PC rel. And that SIM at PC rel just says I, need, I have an offset from the current instruction address. So here we have a very simple thing. We just find out where we are in the text section and we move to the right and find our variable in the data section that way. Now what I've got on here also is to show a little bit of the span uh, that you can address with. So from R2, we have a 32-byte uh, span, positive and negative. So you can go 2 to the 31 to the left or 2 to the 31 to the right. Uh, with the text section, uh, or sorry, with, with uh, PC relative addressing, uh, we have 34 bits of offset, but because the text section is off to the left of the data, effectively we cut that in half and we can only go to the right. So we have effectively 2 to the 33 uh, as our maximum span going that direction. And you'll notice that we also have to cross some of the text section to get to data in the first place. So that, that eats up a little bit of that 2 to the 33 space. With shared data, it's slightly more complicated. Uh, as you guys know, when you've got uh, something off in a, uh, an external dynamic shared offset, you're going to have to do an extra level of indirection to go off and find that uh, data that you're looking for. So what we have today is called talk indirect access addressing. And again, we go and find the talk pointer. We go off and we find an entry in the dot talk section, which then has an address that gets resolved to where the, uh, the actual data is in the DSO. So you see that extra level of indirection. You see that it takes three instructions. Again, we have the add is LD pair in order to find where the talk location is. And then we have one more level of indirection to go and find uh, the, the data that's been filled in for us by the dynamic loader. Uh, for PC relative, we now have something called PC relative got indirect addressing. So again, we're going to start by saying, okay, we need to go and find this thing. And because this is created by the linker, the linker creates the got on PowerPC. So the entry that we're looking for is now in the dot got section. Uh, so we start with the, uh, the current instruction address again. We use the offset to find where we are in the uh, got section uh, here. And then we once again do the indirection to find where we are in the DSO. So what you can see here is, is in both of these cases, the instructions, uh, the number of instructions is smaller. In the first case, we had two instructions before, and now we have one instruction. Uh, because the second one is a double word instruction, the text size is the same, but the number of micro ops for the processor is now one instead of two. Now, previously, we had some fusion uh, to handle you know, the, the uh, previous sequence, so there's not a terrific lot of difference there if fusion kicks in for us, but in this case, we will always get it with the PLD, and we don't always get the fusion today with the other sequence. And once again, the same thing applies here. We have two micro-ops instead of three uh, with the shared data sequence. Is that clear? OK, so let's talk a little about, bit about code models in our ABI. In the LV2 ABI, we have three different code models for data addressing and, and function addressing. Uh, the first is the small uh, code model, which uses only a 16-bit address that's not in use very much these days. Uh, our default is to use the medium code model, which is pretty efficient and gives us a 32-bit address, which is good enough for almost everything. Uh, however, sometimes you can overflow uh, with a 32-bit address. Some of your linker relocations will fail on you and you have to recompile with the large code model, which gives you a full 64-bit address. Uh, we made the choice with PC relative addressing that we will only use it with the medium code model. We have this 34-bit span. 
Uh, that gives us roughly equivalent span to the medium code model. It's never exact, but what you have, you know, as we saw, we cut off one of those bits. We get 2 to the 33 going from the uh, text pointer to the data. And then because we're covering some of the text, which could be very large, uh, that could be cut down a little bit. So basically, it's roughly 2 to the 32 bits uh, of data addressability from the base pointer, whether you're using the old model or the new model. So this is pretty close for us. If you happen to go uh, and overflow things with PC relative on the medium code model, the backup strategy is once again to recompile with the large code model, which will use a talk. So we are not going to get rid of the table of contents pointer for large code model. So call flow, how do we do things today? Uh, so in ELF v2, all functions have both a local entry point and a global entry point. Um, so, you know, just if you're thinking about this uh, off the cuff, local means is just what you're going to call if you're in the same compilation unit is how you might think about it, and global if you're, going, uh, if you're being called uh, from somewhere else. Uh, now, in actuality, what local means is after you've done static linking, then uh, local is within the statically linked object. So that could be your main program or some DSO. So you could have multiple source files linked together and still use uh, local entry points. A global entry point is used when you're called outside of that situation. Uh, the local and global entry points typically will coincide under two circumstances. Uh, first, when there isn't a table of contents pointer required, then you don't need to have a, a global um, uh, entry point at all because uh, there's, all the global entry point does is help you establish the talk for your, uh, for your function. So if you don't need a talk, you don't need the global entry point. The other thing that can happen is if you have a static function, so it's not, it can't possibly be called from outside of your current uh, uh, DOTO or, or your current main program or DSO, then uh, you, can, you don't need a global entry point in that case either because you know that your talk has already been set up by your caller because everybody in the same unit has the same talk by definition. So, um, what do we do with the global entry point? So the global entry point assumes that the address of the function is in register 12. So when, uh, th what it will then do is use register 12 to use these two instructions, this add immediate shifted and add immediate here. Uh, it'll go through and say, okay, where is the dot toc dot symbol that we had on the previous uh, pictures? And load that up into register two. So that's how we get it into register two in the first place. Now the local entry point assumes the register two has already been set up, so we don't need to worry about it, or the register two isn't needed for this particular function. So if you don't need it, you don't need to go through the global entry point. Now when the caller is compiled, it doesn't necessarily know if the call target is going to be statically resolved. If it's in the same compilation unit, it can figure that out itself. But if it doesn't, uh, it has to assume that it's going to go uh, outside of the compilation unit and it's going to possibly get a new talk pointer for whoever it's calling and when it comes back it needs to reestablish its own talk pointer. So the way we handle that is we, ins we put a no-op instruction after the call uh, which is to be used by the linker to fill in with a register uh, restore, a talk restore instruction that will restore it back to where it was. Okay. So how do we implement this internally? So inside the symbol table entry for each function, we have a uh, field that everybody gets to use in their own way. Each architecture can do what they want with it. It's called st other. Uh, what we've chosen to do is, is take the top three bits of st other and use it for this purpose uh, to describe how the, lo the local and global entry points exist. So if that value is set to zero, it means that the two uh, entry points coincide, so we don't have an extra global entry point with those uh, talk establishment. And in that situation, we don't need R12, we don't need R2, and R2 is considered to be preserved by the caller, callee. So the caller will not have to reestablish uh, if it calls this function, it knows that it won't have to reestablish its own talk. One is like zero, except for one thing, and that, this is R2 can be clobbered. Okay, so this is a call or save situation, um, and that's very important because that's what we're going to exploit for PC relative here. 
The remaining values, two through seven, are uh, expanded to say, what's the distance between the beginning of the local entry, the global entry pointer and the beginning of the local entry pointer? We want to be flexible about that. Today, the distance is always eight because we always put in those two instructions, but we envision in the future that could change, so we have different values reserved. In practice today, we only use the value three, which, uh, which says there are eight. And the value zero is used for the case where you have uh, functions that don't require an extra global entry point, okay? So as I said, value one was, an, was uh, provided in anticipation of having a talk-free addressing model at some point, and we're at that point now. So we now need protocols to incorporate these value one functions into the call model. And uh, I want to give some credit to Uli Weigand here in the audience who was uh, very helpful in, in working through this situation and how we did this. So what do we care about with a call? We care about whether it's a local call or an external call. We care about whether or not it uses a talk, whether its callee uses a talk, and whether the callee preserves R2 or not. Those are the things that can differ and, and require us to do different things. Anytime you have an external call, it has to go through procedure linkage table stub. That's just normal. You have to do your dynamic symbol resolution. Um, now, when we have a, call who, a caller who knows he doesn't need to restore his talk, he can add a relocation called no talk onto the call and, uh, that will, and omit the no op because he doesn't want the linker to come in and, and put in the R2 save that we talked about. So that's how we tell the linker about that. Uh, one side issue is that uh, with stack unwinding, when you're sometimes putting an R2 re uh, restore in there and you're sometimes not, the uh, stack unwinder has to be able to figure that out. So that's, that's already done. That's business as usual, but I kind of want to point that out, that it has to do a little bit of work to figure out whether or not it's restoring R2 at each point as it's unwinding the stack. All right, very quickly. Uh, I'll go through some of the, the call protocols that we have here. Um, this first page, the first two here, are just kind of the standard things that we've had all along. Uh, if you've got an external call, you're going to need to, the, and your caller is the talk, and your callee is anything, whether it could be a talk or a PC relative. Uh, the first thing that you had noticed here is that you have to have the no op here, because since the caller needs a talk, he needs to make sure that his uh, talk is restored after this external call. The job of the PLT stub is to resolve the dynamic symbol, save the R2 value for the caller in the caller stack, and set up R12 with the function address. And then the callee uh, will use R12 to set up R2. And I have it in red if needed, because now if the callee is a PC relative function, it doesn't need R2, so it doesn't have to set up R2 anymore. So that's the case where we don't need a global entry point in that case, okay, a separate global entry point. Uh, a local call from talk to talk is uh, something that's already there today. Uh, for there, we say uh, branch with the at no talk symbol, and we don't put the no op in there, so that we don't have to restore the talk because we know that the callee has the same talk that we have, and he will preserve it for us. So the callee then will be called via its local entry point, and it will be sure to preserve R2. Now, here's a new case. Now, if the caller is PC relative and the callee is PC relative, Again, we're going to do this thing that says, I don't care about the talk because I'm PC relative. I don't want you to restore it. I don't care about talks. And when you, you will call the callee at its local entry point, and now the callee is free to use R2 any way that it wants to. So a PC relative caller will clobber R2 possibly, okay? Uh, the top two here are other issues that uh, come up uh, fairly frequently. So here's an external call from a PC relative uh, function to a talk-based function. This is the really important one because this is, you have an existing glibc that, that requires a talk and your new code doesn't provide a talk, so what are you going to do? All right, well, your caller doesn't care about the talk, so he says don't restore it when you're done. Um, and he uses a special PLT stub, which is like the normal PLT stub, except it won't save register two because we don't care about it when it comes back. Then the call E will be called at its global entry point. It'll set up R2 on its own like it always does, and it's free to go along. So we didn't have to make any changes there to the existing guy. Uh, so that's the really important case. If you have a call from a PC relative uh, caller to an external PC relative call E, uh, the PLT stub that the linker provides is even simpler because we no longer have to set up R12 because it doesn't need to create its own R2 and it can collaborate and all that sort of thing. So 
those are, that's, that's where we can do a lot of savings with the new version of PC Relative. There's a lot of stuff that got turned red there that got removed. Okay. Uh, finally, these last two cases are somewhat unusual because here we've got a local call from a talk based thing to a PC Relative thing or vice versa. That means you're in the same um, unit, but one of you is, is using a talk and one of you isn't. That's weird, right? But it can happen, for example, if you compile uh, one, uh, one program using PC Relative and you statically link against something that was built with a talk uh, and you don't have source code so you can't go and rebuild that yourself. So this can come up in practice. Uh, so in those cases, we have special trampolines, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through a lot of uh, effort to talk about what happens there, but you can, you can see that on your own. I want to make sure Mike has time to get back to, uh, to his stuff. So, uh, With regard to uh, relocations that Mike talked about, he mentioned the 34-bit address. Uh, this is what the prefix instruction looks like. You'll see that, uh, again, the second instruction here, the second uh, four bytes, is the normal a uh, load instruction that has the 16-bit piece here, and then there's this previous prefix uh, on top of that, which has the additional 18 bits that are used there. So over here to the left, there will be some, there will be an opcode for the prefix, and then there are a bunch of reserved bits that get used for a variety of other things. So it, we really, this is sort of the limit. We got, we could get up to 34 bits, but we wanted to reserve the rest of it for other uses. Okay, we added a bunch of relocations for PC relative use. And we had to have a, a whole bunch more relocations for thread local storage, but I'm not going to go into that today. That's a, that's a whole other uh, bag of worms. Um, Mike has more on this, so I'll just go over this very quickly. Um, we want to make sure that uh, when we have this got indirect PC relative offsetting uh, addressing where we're going um, off to shared code, that it's as efficient as possible. So it could be, if you go back to this uh, picture, here that the, when you go to do this uh, this uh, this uh, three two instruction sequence here that you didn't really need to do it because this DSO isn't where it was it was actually in the same unit with you and so then you could just do a direct addressing like you did on the previous chart and it would be nice and clean so we do have the ability to do uh, have the linker do that optimization if it if it recognizes that it can be uh, taken care of locally. And uh, that's it for my part. If there are any questions on the ABI stuff, I can take those now, or we can just let Mike go for it. Yeah, go ahead, Florian. Um, wait, hold on. Does the link ABI change if I rebuild a library with uh, PC relative addressing, in the sense that uh, my uh, the client code will use a different call sequence because the link editor performs different relaxations. So if if you go ahead and rebuild your library uh, with PC relative, then it will yeah all the symbol table entries for those functions will then be marked uh, appropriately, so that they have that st other sequence of one in them, and then if you uh, build against if your application is. Uh, uh, dynamically linking against that, that will automatically be taken care of uh, by the linker and the dynamic loader to uh, to use the new sequence. Yeah. Okay, that means that I can't use uh, the uh, if I link again. Say I have got a new glibc build with these optimizations, and I, and I link against that. Um, I can't run the binaries on. Uh, Power 9 and earlier anymore because... No, that's not true. Uh, you can go ahead and continue to, to do that. It's, it's all taken care of in the PLT stubs uh, for, the, for the indirections. So external calls always go through the PLT stubs. And um, so when you link to the new thing, it's going to go through that different PLT okay, stub. Okay, we, we need there. to discuss it offline. Okay, it's, yeah, we should. I, we should. I I'm sorry, I think I'm missing your point, so, yeah. Other questions, or shall we let Mike go ahead? All right, thanks, folks. Oops, Oops. and you just unplugged it. Did I? No, I yes. didn't think so. I did just unplug it. You want to take this? Yeah. Just for a second. I know what I did. It's right here. Nope, not right No, here. it's right. It's up by it. Oh, oh, I see it. Got it. All right, sorry for the clumsiness.
That should. You know, there we go. There we go. All right. Thanks. Got one feedback. Okay. This is the things prefix instruction attribute length, final ins and target hooks, extensions, and then slightly talk about the PC rel optimization. I took I took some of the slides out because Bill was talking about it earlier, and then I'll give you some statistics. One of the ways when I first started doing this was I did it what I call the traditional way, and that is just add new constraints and attributes. Um, in particular, at the time, because at the time we did not have, we had DS and DQ um, prefix instructions. We needed something like three or four um, new constraints, and you have to also use new alternatives in the move DI. In particular, move DI is something like 28 alternatives right now, and it went over the limit when I first did this. There are ways to bump up the limit, but it, we didn't really like like this. So Seger suggested that, um, actually it's on the next slide, that we use instant attributes instead, and we have this magic prefix attribute, that if the prefix attribute is yes, and then we have this whole code to, to calculate whether the instruction really is prefixed, um, it, the length attribute then uses that prefix and says that the length is 12 instead of 4. And there's two, alter two other things, prefix length and pre non-prefix length, that just makes it simpler to implement the length um, attribute. Um, as, as I said before, um, when you have, the, even though the prefix instruction is 8, you really have to tell the compiler it's 12 because of the implicit no-op. And doing this, there's a lot less implementation in terms of the actual move DI and so forth. A lot of the changes that we did, in fact, in move DI and, and so forth, well, move DI and, and SD, move SCI are special because they can also load up larger constants. But besides that, most of the changes were to get the thing, <coughs> thing to use the star for the length so that it would automatically use the prefix or non-prefix um, length rather than um, hardwiring for 8 or 12 or, or whatever. And in addition, a lot of the times in the length calculations, we really don't need it until the end of the compiler. But with prefix stuff, we, we need it earlier. And, in, and one of the things that we stumbled in on that I didn't realize we were doing was the instant cost thing looks at the length of the instruction. And so if it's um, 12, it will think it's three times as expensive as a, as a regular normal thing. And so it'll try and load the thing up, be helpful, and try and load the thing up to the register. So that we did have to take that into account. But the thing is, is that the length is sometimes done more earlier and so things like um, TF mode, that's the long double that uses two IBM doubles, when you actually use it, it is already split. By the time you actually do get to final, it is split. But when it's called for the length operation in, in the costing and all, it's done much earlier. And as I said, 12 bytes rather than four bytes, and the assembler d does the appropriate magic. Now, right now, we, we just, do it with 12 bytes. But if somebody is really determined, uh, they could go through and figure out exactly what the attributes are and how the, align the alignment is and, and so forth. That, that is a lot of work and it also makes sure, you have to make sure that all the other places in the compiler set the length correctly. Um, just before this uh, meeting, I, I built spec 2017 setting the length to eight. And it turned out that there are eight, uh, six benchmarks in spec 2017 and two benchmarks in spec 2006. You know, not necessarily spec is be all and end all, but it's just large pieces of code that's useful to, to run through the compiler. But there are six benchmarks because the problem is, is that the conditional branch instruction is short. And so if the length, if the compiler thinks the length is longer, 
it has to do a, a branch around the conditional branch, uh, a conditional branch around an unconditional branch, so it can jump to the larger location. And as I said, six of the two, spec 2017 and two of the spec 2006 things re, um, are just at the hairy edge. You know, if you if you set the length to eight, they won't they won't build. So obviously, for for normal user code, we have to set it to 12. And you know, as I mentioned before, the assembler does not automatically go to a prefix instruction. You have to tell it that this is a prefix instruction. You know, there are pros and cons both ways, uh, but this way, particularly with alignments and all that kind of stuff, we felt it was safer that you be explicit when you do this. Now, how, whether users will work, this will work if people have loads and stores in assembly code. Um, you know, ASM code and GCC, I don't know. We, we may have to cross that bridge when you do it or just tell people, don't do a load in the ASM code, do, do it yourself or don't, don't do the prefix, you know. Be, be smarter. And for the prefix instructions I'm talking here, all the form is using a leading P in front of the instruction. There might be prefix instructions that that won't hold for, but we in the compiler team would prefer that all prefix instructions begin with a P. The way we do this is we use a hook in final scan instant that this is the used in final that the last time it looks at the instant it calls this hook and the hook then says are you a prefix instruction and if it is sets a flag so that the asm output opcode uh, which is another target hook that's just before it emits the opcode, can, can do something. Now, in the GCC target hooks, you can actually change the code. And in fact, originally, I had this, um, when we had the assembly, we wanted to use PLI, PLI, but the assembler at the time did not support using PLI, PLI as, an, as a thing for PADDI. And so I actually changed the PLI to PADDI, but we fixed the assembler. So right now we only use, in this part of the code, we only use this for emitting the, the P. But we do, in PC rel opt, also use it for doing all the other stuff for PC rel, PC rel opt. And as I said, in general, we don't have to change the instruction template or use a new print operand code uh, for the alternatives. So, um, another alternative that I had, I thought of was use a percent exclamation mark or something like that. Much like we have in the load instruction right now, we have percent capital U that says whether you issue a U because it's an update instruction, whether and percent capital X whether it's an index instruction. We could do a similar thing for uh, prefixed, but it was it was just a lot simpler to um, do this automatically. Of course, the problem is, is you know, it, it is done automatically and you, and you might have places where in the future it might not work. Sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. But as I, as I mentioned before, we now, in prefix instructions, do not have the distinction between D, DS, and DQ. And a lot of my work recently has been to try and automatically recognize this case. So, for example, if you do a LD instruction, you um, need it to be DS form. And if you actually have an odd offset, it has to load up the offset and use an index operation. But if you did that, that load operation to a floating point, reg a traditional floating point register, that's a D form instruction, so you don't have to do the thing. And then, but, the Altavec register is also a DES form, so we've had cases where the register allocator is trying to get smart and says, oh, this is an odd offset. I will uh, magically put it into the floating point register and then do a move. Well, if the move operation was cheap, that might be fine, but in some of our process, some of our older processors, the, the direct move instruction between the uh, GPRs and the Alterec registers is more expensive than we would like. So 
the compiler does now to try try to figure out, and as I said, this is one of the things that I've gone over and over a few times in different implementations, to automatically change from um, using the traditional instruction. So even if the offset is 16 bits, but because if the compiler thinks that it might be a used in a DS context or a DQ context, it will it will automatically generate a prefix instruction. One of the other extensions was um, we do have load quad and store quad in the GPR registers that loads up uh, two registers and store quad uh, and so forth, and they have some restrictions, but those instructions were defined before we started doing little endian, and they load the registers in the wrong order. So what we do is in little endian, we just don't generate those instructions. Now, uh, there is a atomic version of those instructions, only indexed form, and we do generate that, but we have to actually swap the registers uh, because that's the only atomic instruction we have for 128 bits. The hardware now does um, do PLQ and PSTORQ on a little endian system. It'll put them in the right registers. So we can, in theory, use it. Right now, we have not. I, I did have some initial patches to do this. It broke things, and so I, I took it out to, to look at other things. And sometime later, we may, may go back to, to fixing it. But um, this is one of the advantages of having the hardware company hire GCC developers, in theory, because you know if, if you start the time early enough, you might be able to catch things like whether DS and DQ that make th make things simpler for the compiler. You know, it's always a push and shove in terms of what gets added and what doesn't get added. Um, Bill talked about PC Rel Opto a little bit, and this is um, this is a rather tricky optimization, and it 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 can potentially break. Uh, the, but the idea is is if you know this is an external symbol. And um, you want to reference it, but there's only one reference. The compiler can change this into this magic PC rel opt optimization. But the and so I, I added a pass to to do the, to look in the in each basic block to see if there's a load address, and and then the use and the use dies with it and it has all the proper stuff, but. Um, Right now, to be for safety's sake, I have it as as the pass before final, and Sager and I have been having some discussions about, yeah, this still could break if somebody else adds another pass before final or something else, and so it's probably one of the things I need to rethink about. But in order to use this optimization, you know, because again, there can only be one load address and one use of the register. Um, it, I only looked in basic blocks. I did not try to optimize loading the address in one basic block and then in another basic block you having the use. For example, you know, doing the load before and if then else construct and then doing the, the store or load using that register. Between the load, if you're doing a load operation between the load of the pointer of the address and the secondary load, there must be no re references to the register being loaded with the second second load. In other words, you have to assume that the lifetime of the thing being loaded is at the first instruction, not the second instruction. Um, can you just turn that off? And um, similarly for store, the um, store operation must be, uh, the value must be live in the register before doing this, the store, live at the register at the time you do the load address and, and kept live until you do, you do the store. And um, one of the keys is, is, it, is peepholes don't, aren't as useful for this because it does not have to be adjacent instructions. With an adjacent instruction, you know, if, if, if 
there, if you did the load address and you immediately used it, it would be simpler to use than a peephole. But as I said, peepholes don't do this. And the optimization actually works even if things are separate. And I have statistics later to say whether or not, you know, that it does actually help with things being separate. And here are some statistics that I gathered. Now, as Aaron pointed out before this meeting, it would have been helpful to have also statistics for the talk stuff on the same benchmark, but there, you know, it's already too, too much for people to, to do, do it. But, you know, the idea is in spec 2017, with the current compiler and, and so forth, we, we do like 166,000 PC relative loads and 41,000 stores. And 46,000 times we did a load immediate of an address, of a number. And, but the big thing was is the 311,000 times we did the load of an address for various reasons. Switch table, um, calling a function with the address of a static variable, um, using it in an indexed operation and so forth. I, I do track that, I, one of the things that surprised me in this was we have a large number of stores with numeric offsets that are more than 16 bits. This is um, typically, you know, a large offset. And I tracked it down in, so, in some of the cases. What it is is um, a lot of the Fortran benchmarks just have large stack frames. So we are now able to compile code that does have large stack frames, more than 65K, with only using one instruction to access the stack variables instead of having to do two or three instructions. As I mentioned before about the DS and DQ, we do have a few cases where we had odd offsets that the, previously the compiler had to do the load immediate and then use an indexed form. But more to the point with the DQ instructions loading up the vector, we had almost 60,000 cases. And there the problem was is you're oftentimes loading up something that's talk based or now P PC relative and you just could not guarantee that you had double word alignment between both the talk entry and the instruction being loaded up. And that now with the, with the um, prefix instruction we can. And, you know, I was just talking about the PC rel optimization and in spec we get about 100,000 places where the PC rel op fires. Most, mostly um, 100,000 loads and 18,000 stores. And as I said, you can split the, the load, the address from the use, and that's like 82,000 times. And, um, but the places where it's adjacent is 36. Yes? I don't know, five, five minutes. Oh, five minutes, okay. And um, I had some other slides about vector pairs. I covered them more in the register allocation. But one of the other things is we are thinking about adding vector pairs that will load up two vectors at the same time. And that causes a lot of problems with register allocation. So any other questions? Come on, you can do it. <laughs> Yes. What's the status of text relocation support in Dynamic Lenka for L3.2 API? Is there something we have to do there, or is that completely dead? So uh, maybe I'll give Tulio my mic. So yes, that's something we have to do. And um, yeah, it's in the process. It's nice because when you start doing, using this in GLBC, we start seeing a lot of things. And people start thinking that the ABI is broken, and Bill has to convince them it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's the current status. We are finding a lot of bugs. And yeah. That's what we are doing now. OK, so there's still text relocation support for L3.2. I wasn't aware of that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, to, to some extent, that's still a work in progress, everything here. So uh... uh, 
Can you explain what this is about? I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about. Uh, what ex specifically? What Florian was asking about? What if if it's necessary to implement um, um, something in the loader to to support uh, this? And support what? Uh, uh, the C relative uh, relocations dynamically. I don't yeah, that did why would you need? I mean, those can be resolved by the static linker. I would Sometimes say. no. Sometimes you have to resolve that in, in the loader. If it's to an external module. Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk about offline. I don't see okay. why this should ever happen unless you do something very weird. Okay. I think, you know, it's fair to say that we don't necessarily have the complete answer to that yet because we're still in the process of uh, continuing our implementation and making sure there aren't bugs in it. So it could be that we're just seeing some, uh, some bugs in, in how things are created in the compiler or in the static linker that are showing up and looking like they're dynamic linker issues. But my suspicion is that they're not, but we'll see. Okay, okay, everyone, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and a round of applause, please. Thanks, folks.